Hi everyone, my name is Lee Pucker and I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum and I'd like to welcome you to this seventh webinar in uh, the forum's webinar series uh, entitled Top-Down Design of Wireless Systems. Uh, just a few, uh, just a uh, few pieces of background before we get started. The slides that are presented during this webinar are going to be posted uh, on our website. If you go to the main homepage, you'll see a link that says webinars, tutorials, and more. If you just click there, then that'll give you the page where you'll find um, the slides from this webinar and all the webinars that we've done. The uh, slides and the recording of this webinar will be uh, available later today, and so I encourage you to check back uh, later to find them. If you have any questions or need any uh, additional information on the webinar, please feel free to send me an email. My email address is lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org, and you'll be able to find it then. A uh, few tips on the interface before we get started. You'll have a control panel that you see on the right side of your screen. If you, there's a little double arrow there. If you click that double arrow, that'll actually make the, that'll minimize the screen for you. So you can actually make that go back and forth by simply clicking the double arrow. Uh, for those of you who logged in for the first time, you'll be uh, logged in using your microphone and speakers. Uh, you often get better connection if you use a telephone. The way you do that is you simply click the Use Telephone button under the audio portion of your control panel. Um, that'll bring up the dial-in number that you can use, as well as the access code in the audio pin. The audio pin gives you uh, audio control, so if you want to raise your hand to talk during the conference, you can. Uh, there's a questions window. Uh, the speaker today has asked that all questions occur at the end of his talk. So if you can use the questions window and simply type your questions in, then uh, when we get to the end of the session, we can go through those questions and, and one at a time. It's often a good idea for you to do the questions as, you, as they come to you, so that way uh, we, have a, we have a list of questions and can go back through them at the end. Uh, also, when we get to the question session, if you wish to speak uh, directly, everybody's microphone is currently muted, but if you wish to speak directly to the presenter, there is a um, raise your hand button that's in your control panel. If you click on that, then it indicates to us that you'd like your microphone turned on, and we'll go ahead and enable that capability. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce Chris Aiden of the MathWorks. Uh, Chris is uh, going to present the webinar today, and so Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Lee. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thanks for taking the time out of your, your morning. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll learn a few things uh, about how to use MathWorks tools to do top-down design um, and about uh, top-down design in general. Um, so. I've, the, uh, the, the format I'm going to use today is uh, I'm going to use the uh, PowerPoint to set up the, uh, the uh, design problem, and then I'll quickly move into the uh, MathWorks tools, primarily Simulink, uh, with, with MATLAB as well, uh, to show how MATLAB and Simulink can be used for top-down design of wireless systems. I'm going to focus on the receiver today, um, more so than the transmitter. Uh, just in, in the interest of time, but the uh, the uh, the theme is the same, and and so so let me get started here. What is top-down design? Uh, what are the MathWorks tools for top-down design? I'm going to focus on SimRF to some extent, which is a MathWorks tool for uh, design of RF systems, and systems really being the operative word there. And uh, then we're going to talk about an 802.15 uh, design example. So what is top-down design? Um, top-down design, this is, this is per Kundert and Chang in a, in a uh, uh, white paper they wrote. Uh, it's available on designersguide.org. 
Uh, Top-down design and verification methodology uh, systematically proceeds from architecture to transistor level design. Uh, the, uh, the idea here is that we want to start at a high level, at the system level, where the, uh, the, the design of the receiver or the, the transmitter, the wireless system, uh, is the most abstract. And then with each design iteration, we want to add complexity and fidelity. And in a lot of respects, uh, we, we see a lot of people that are using uh, transistor-level design tools that are very good in their own right, but they're using them for system-level design. And uh, again, hopefully I can, I can show you how uh, system-level design using system-level design tools can be very complementary to your existing circuit-level design tools. So this is the, uh, the design architecture that we're going to talk about today. It's uh, very typical uh, zero IF design. Uh, from uh, along the, the top, we've got the direct conversion receiver. We've got a high-speed sigma delta data converter, a decimation filter, and a digital baseband. Uh, there's an analog PLL, and then reconfigurable analog filters. Um, and, and the reconfigurability part, that probably means more to people that are designing uh, multi-band designs. Uh, but in general, again, at the system level, what I hope to show you is that, that with the right set of tools, you can design a receiver for a single application or a variety of different applications. So what are MathWorks tools for top-down design, i.e. system level design uh, at the at the abstract level, we make SimRF, which is a tool for, uh, again, RF system design for uh, analog mixed signal blocks. Uh, you actually benefit from some free software available on MATLAB Central called Delta Sigma Toolbox that runs in MATLAB. And I'll show a little bit of that today for the uh, data converter design. And then Simulink and Sim Power Systems are very useful tools for abstract behavioral level analog modeling. For all digital design uh, tasks, you've got DSP System Toolbox, which works in both MATLAB and Simulink, uh, as well as the Communication System Toolbox for applications that are, are focused on communication systems with special emphasis on wireless communication systems. For analog PLL, uh, MathWorks makes the control system toolbox at the end of the day. Uh, we all know that, that the analog PLL is a feedback system. So there's, there's some very useful tools there. We're not going to go into PLL design today. We just don't have the time. Uh, we're going to focus at the system level. And then uh, for other pure analog systems, again, the control system toolbox and Simulink are very useful. So again, I'm going to focus a little bit on SimRF today. Uh, and, and again, SimRF is MathWorks tool for system level design. Uh, inside of SimRF, there are two simulation technologies, circuit envelope and equivalent baseband. And what, what that allows you to do is, is uh, traverse, if you will, that Pareto front that uh, is defined by model fidelity and simulation speed. At the end of the day, most designs have to be simulated at the circuit level. And what we're offering is, is two technologies, equivalent baseband and circuit envelope, that allow you to start off at a very abstract level and realize very high speed simulation. And then, uh, and then gradually migrate up to your circuit simulation tools. Nice thing about SimRF is it's very tightly integrated with the uh, the DSP design tools that uh, MathWorks is, is uh, uh, very, very uh, widely used for. So again, what is SimRF? What's in the box? We've got actually three libraries, idealized baseband, which is very abstract, equivalent baseband, which adds some fidelity and starts to model things like S parameters. And then circuit envelope gives us uh, all of the blocks we need to model, and I'll show you this, uh, receivers and or in general RF subsystems at, uh, at the system level, but with, with much more fidelity, including things like IP2 and IP3, uh, 
we custom filter design because interconnectivity or, or, or flexible connectivity with passive components can be, uh, can be used to realize different filters. And we also supply some, some of the most common noise sources. And again, so, so this, is, this toolkit is, is intended to span very fast, very abstract designs all the way down to uh, more detailed system level designs. So that's, that's pretty much the intro. Uh, the, the design example that I'm going to show you, probably the, the interesting part, is uh, we, we're, we've, we've been looking at an 802.15.4 Zigbee standard. Uh, we'll look at the air interface today in the ISM band. So some of the high-level specs at, for the, the, the waveform are 250 kilobit per second. It's uh, direct sequence spread spectrum, so we've got a two megachips per second uh, chipping rate, OQPSK modulation, and then half-time pulse shaping. We want to design this particular receiver to be robust in the presence of UMTS interference at the 2500 megahertz. And we also want to design for a, a very aggressive uh, sensitivity spec at minus 100 dBm. And, and then we want this to be low cost. The low cost part of it is, has already been decided based on the, uh, the architecture that we chose. If, if you recall, we're looking at a direct conversion design, uh, so we're looking for very high levels of integration. So here's the design task, and, and there's, this is somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, flexible in the sense that everybody's design process is a little bit different. But Again, from a top-down perspective, we want to make sure that we design at the system level and then fold complexity in each, each uh, step of the way. So the first thing we need to do is design the transmitter. If nothing else, the receiver undoes everything that happens in the transmitter. So we have to have a transmitter as part of the test bench. Uh, then the next, the next part of the process is if we're going to design the RF and analog part of the transceiver, we need to have the DSP part of the transceiver again, as part of the test bench. And in general, what we're going to use as our performance specification is bit error rate. As you, as you know, the, uh, the bit error rate for standard compliant waveforms is, is very well specified, as well as uh, if you were designing military communication systems, that's at the end of the day what, what most system designers really care about. So we're going to use bit error rate. And to get there, we have to have the, uh, the demodulator and all the DSP part of the design, and we're going to embed that in our test bench. So we're going to have uh, some behavioral level models for the data converter. Why? So that we can determine what is what is the gain requirement of the of the RF front end. Um, we'll add some of the direct conversion impairments. We'll we'll do a little bit of of uh, tuning of the model so that we can get back to, to high-speed simulation once we migrate to circuit envelope. And effectively, what, what we're going to do is, is remove the spread spectrum channel coding and uh, reduce the, the simulation time. So, so what you'll see is we'll start in, in uh, uh, simulating the, the bit error rate, and then we'll migrate over the chip error rate once we, we decide that uh, we need the fidelity of circuit envelope simulation. And then we're going to uh, add interference. Uh, like I said in the in the uh, uh, the, the design spec, we, we want to design the system to be robust in, in uh, the presence of UMTS interference. So we're going to actually add that interference signal into our test bench. And then we're going to, at a very high level, design the, uh, the data converter that is used in this particular design. And with the data converter, the decimation filter. So we're going to look at. Again, the, we've got a test bench in, in mind, and uh, in general, we're not going to use a, a fully compliant Zigbee waveform. Rather, we're going to construct that part of the waveform that is most useful when designing uh, this, this particular receiver. So we're, we're concerned with the, uh, the spectrum, the, uh, um, the modulation, the channel shape, the I'm sorry, pulse shaping filters, and things like this. And and what we're going to do to verify that our waveform is in fact representative of of a of a true Zigbee waveform is I'm going to just show a quick video 
that I downloaded from the Aslan website to verify the spectrum of our waveform, and then we're going to move past that and focus on the design of the receiver. So with that, we're going to leave PowerPoint behind and move over to MATLAB. And what I've done is I've generated an HTML file, which is which you can do from any MATLAB script. Uh, in this case, here's my MATLAB script. I push this little button here. I can generate the HTML file that we were looking at automatically. And where that's useful is it, it gives me a place to reference the flow of the, the design, in this case, the flow of this, this webinar. So there's no no uh, sleight of hand in terms of, of how I'm using this, this HTML site. So here's the specs again. We want a, uh, we want to define the waveform, um, which, which is all defined in these bullets here. Here's our performance specification. And at the end of the day, we also want to get a, uh, uh, we're going to design a data converter that gets us closer to the circuit level implementation. So let's start with the transmitter. Start in the right directory. So if we start with the transmitter, what's in the transmitter? So we've got a binary data source. We've got a pseudo-random number generator, multiplier. We're going to modulate that a, the waveform using QPSK, apply a half sine wave filter, which is defined in the standard. And then we're going to offset the uh, the I and the Q branch to realize the O part of the OQPSK, and then there's just a simple calibration block. And then, and then at the end of the day, we're going to look at the spectrum. And just again to verify that this spectrum is useful for for our design purposes, I'm going to compare this very briefly to a uh, a quick video again that used by uh, the the that's the agile and test and measurement hardware. So once this settles, it'll give us a good reference point. So there it is. Here's the uh, the waveform, the standard compliant waveform per the agile measurement. Here's our waveform right here. So the point here is that we didn't need an entire standard in order to do the design of the air interface, but we did need to verify that we've got the proper waveform because we are using bit error rate uh, as, as, a, as a specification for our, our system. So check, we've got a transmitter that works. What next? Okay, the next the next part of the flow, and again, this is all about top-down. So we, we've got our transmitter here. We, we created a, a subsystem. There's some overhead blocks here that we're going to use later so that we can switch from the the equivalent baseband to the, the circuit envelope paradigm. Uh, we've got an AWGN channel, but before we do the simulation, let's look at the receiver. And like I said in earlier is, is if nothing else the receiver undoes the transmitter so we've got the uh, we delay the I branch I'm sorry we delayed the Q branch before we'll delay the I branch and now we're lined up we do the uh, the match filtering normalize QPSK demodulation despreading and then we have bits out those so are transmit data coming in receive data coming out and everything else is more or less overhead. So what you see is, is uh, I've already set the, uh, the power level for the transmitter to be our specification, which is, or, or rather a design requirement, which is minus 100 dBm uh, input power. And down here we've got the, uh, the signal that was transmitted. Here we've got the receive signal that's corrupted by noise. Here's the constellation diagram. Here's our bit error rate. As you can see, we've got we've got uh, measurably no bit error rate. If you let this run for a couple minutes, 
uh, you will in fact measure a bit error rate, but in fact it's uh, it does meet our spec at, at this level. So here's the litmus test. If I increase the power, yeah, I expect to see the spectrum come out of the noise. Here's my my constellation. So everything here appears to be working. Now, in fact, if if uh, if I wanted to, to let this, this simulation run to its conclusion and measure bit error rate, I wouldn't tune the power level, but I did include this, this, uh, this slider block so that you could interact with the model, and I've, I've included it in all the subsequent models as well. So again, we've got a transmitter, we've got a receiver, we've got a very coarse uh, uh, specification for, uh, for what it takes to meet the standard, in this case, uh, minus 0 0.5 dB, uh, signal noise ratio meets the spec that we set out of uh, six one hundredths of a percent of bit error rate. So we'll stop that. And again, so what did we learn in that in that particular uh, design that that model? We need an SNR of minus one half of a dB in order to meet the spec. And again, I mean, buried in here is, is all the, the uh, benefits of, of the, uh, direct spec the uh, direct sequence spread spectrum channel coding as well. Otherwise, you'd expect that to be much higher. So the next thing to do is, all right, if you've got the signal noise ratio, you can start to rely or at least get a starting point in terms of heuristics. And maybe heuristic is not the right term. Maybe it's static, static uh, analysis, where you know the sensitivity is minus 100. So you know what the and you know what the signal noise ratio is. That means we know that we need a noise level of minus 99 and a half dBm. So again, if we if we just use heuristics and, and uh, static analysis, we start from a minus 174 dBm per hertz noise floor, and we include the bandwidth that uh, the usable bandwidth in the signal, 2.6 megahertz. Um, and then we add the, that gives us our noise floor, add that to the, uh, to our, our, the noise level spec that we can tolerate, and that says that we can, our receiver can introduce a, as much as 10 dB of, of noise uh, in terms of the, the, the overall noise figure of the system. So that gives us our noise spec. The other spec in the receiver has to be the gain, which is then determined by the the, uh, the data converter. So that's why we have to introduce a data converter. Again, the, the idea here is we're not going to include complexity unless we need it, uh, because otherwise we might find ourselves wrapped around the axle. So the highest level abstraction for a data converter will have an effective number of bits of 10. We'll set the saturation power to 0 dBm. Um, so then our, our dynamic range is going to be six times the, the E knob plus 2, so we're looking at 62. If we want to get, uh, if we want to add it at, again, this is using heuristics, a tenth of a dB to the SNR, that means we've got to be actually 16 dB below the, uh, the noise floor. So if we do the algebra, we find out that we need a gain of, of 53 dB, 53 and a half. So that's how we could, if, if if we were just going to use static analysis, we'd probably be finished with the specifications, and we hand that to the the uh, RF and analog design team, and off they go. But there's not a lot of information there, and that's where we're going to use system simulation to add add more color to that this particular design. So here's here's the the, the model that captures and tests all of those heuristics. We've got an amplifier that has a gain in a noise figure. We've got a data converter with an effective number of bits, 10, full scale power of 0, and uh, the normalization resistance is, is necessary in this case because we're actually using, we're in a 1 ohm environment here, we'll migrate to 50 ohms later, uh, but that's, uh, that's, the most, uh, that, that's the most relevant impedance to be at for this particular stage of the model. So the transmitter we reused, the receiver we reused, and let's go ahead and simulate this and see what happens. So again, familiar spectrum, familiar constellation diagram, and 
here we are again, increase the power, tighten up the constellation, set our spec back to minus 100. Doesn't look nice, but again, if you let this run, if you look at the speed, I, we can stop to emphasize that. Th that's what makes this, this uh, simulation uh, palatable, is that, is that we can run fast enough to cram enough bits in without waiting uh, hours, if not days, for the simulation. And that's, that's the benefit of system-level simulation. If we can't do that, then it's, it's not as useful to us. Be it as it may, what, what, what you find using the system-level model is, in fact, instead of the 42 dB of, of gain, I believe we said it was we said we needed 50, 54 dB of gain. The system simulation says we need 45 dB and the noise figure instead of 10 dB we can get by with 9 dB. So now what we've done is we've, we've not just We've got the same specs we had before, but we've got specs that we verified with system simulation as opposed to static analysis or heuristics. So these are these probably aren't perfect numbers, but they're better numbers, especially if, if you're worried about over-designing your system. And it's up to you as to, as to how much margin you, you feel like you need to include there. So that was the outcome of, of that stage of the design, is we've got, now we've got a, an improved noise figure and improved gain. But we still haven't really added any of the uh, the constituent pieces to the design. We can't we can't partition the design among your LNA mixer designer. You can't go out in the market look for the saw filter that that you might need, and and start to design some of the other things like the uh, the uh, uh, frequency synthesizer, the analog filters. It's it's just it's it's a high level course design. So we want to add more detail. And what we're adding in this case is uh, the actual blocks of the design. So what you see here is, again, same transmitter. I've wrapped the, the model around just to, just to look better on, on your screen. Uh, we have the same transmitter. We've got the same receiver we used before. But now we've introduced, instead of that single block for to represent the entire receiver's gain and noise figure, we can partition the receiver into the, the band select filter, in this case a saw filter, a low noise amplifier, a mixer, VGA, and down here, and I'll, I'll go into these blocks in a little more detail, is we've got a, a baseband flicker noise model. Why? Because we know we're doing a direct conversion design, and it might be prudent to introduce flicker noise at this stage of the design. So what's in the saw filter model? So this is just a, a data file I pulled off the web. We can look at that data file. Right, familiar insertion loss of the uh, of a saw filter, rather S21. Insert, insertion loss, I believe, is, is 2.5 dB. So that's, that's a usable feature. Very abstract description for the LNA, but we can specify gain. This could be frequency dependent if you choose, um, as well as the noise figure and nonlinearity data. And this is from the equivalent baseband library. So we, we don't expect to get that much fidelity, but we do expect an improvement over a single, a single gain block with noise figure. The, uh, the S parameter mixer in this case is again very abstract. It doesn't this particular block doesn't perform frequency translation per se, but it does include the effect of noise. And in this case, we also have the flexibility to include the phase noise skirt description of a uh, of a measured PLL. I've I've made it variables, and just to make this perfectly transparent, I define those variables in the preload right here. So we're, I'm basically defining the, the, the relative power levels in DVC and the frequency breakpoints. So it's a, a very typical and a logarithmic description of a, of a PLL. 
So that block allows us to add the, again, the phase noise. And let's go ahead and start running this, this particular model. And then I'll talk a little bit about the flicker noise model. One of the unique features of, of using MATLAB and Simulink is really, or Simulink in this, in this example, is, is that MATLAB is never too far away. And what I mean by that, let's go ahead and increase the power just so that it, it looks nicer, um, is that in this case I defined a behavioral model for the flicker noise by simply calling a MATLAB function. When I initialize this block, I call the function pink noise. And this is just a behavioral level model. And let's, what is pink noise? Let's have a look. Pink noise is, is simply a description of the 1 over F noise in the frequency domain that is specified here. And all I do is apply a IFFT to that frequency domain description to back out a discrete time filter in the time domain for the same, the same noise. So I, again, the, the descriptions in the frequency domain, our simulation is in fact in the time domain, so using the IFFT feature in MATLAB is very handy for generating this type of behavioral model. And we'll do that again later on in, the, uh, in the, the sequence of models. So again, MATLAB's never too far away. It's very useful in this case for generating behavioral model of the, of the flicker noise. Because again, I'm at the system level. I don't have the transistor level models that I would need to uh, generate that, that, uh, that noise otherwise. So let's bring that model back up. And again, if, if we continue to let this run, and I, I can share, the, I certainly will share these models if you're interested, just email me I'll, and, and you can play, at these, play with these at, at when you have time. You'll see that the, the design will meet our spec. But again, what's interesting here is now all of a sudden our system noise figure went from, remember it was 10 dB down to 9 dB, now we're at 7.5 dB. And more than that, we've, we've been able to take the liberty to partition that system level noise figure among these different blocks. So in this case, I chose 4, 9, and 12 for the, uh, the LNA, the mixer, and the variable gain amplifier. And uh, now we've got a set of specs. And likewise, I did that for the gain. But now we've got a set of specs that we can give to downstream component designers that start to make sense to them. And we've, they've been verified at the system level to give us the the bit error rate performance that we do indeed require. Other specs that, that come out of this model is the, uh, the in-band phase noise. This, this particular design meets our spec at minus 80 dBC for the in-band portion of the noise. Um, and then also the flicker noise corner frequency at 10 kilohertz. That was calibrated to the minus 100 dBm sensitivity level. You would have to recalibrate based on the needs of your system. And to some extent, all of these numbers are going to trade off one another. And so there's an infinite number of combinations that will meet the spec. This is just the, the, uh, the values I chose to, uh, to illustrate the point. And the, the, I think that from a design point of view, this is a very iterative process because different, different components can have a continuum of different levels for noise, figure, and gain. Um, it's, uh, again, it's an iterative design process, so you need a very fast tool so you can perform iterations, i.e. system level simulation makes, makes an awful lot of sense. So we've refined our design. I'll remind you where we are. Is now we're at, we need a system noise figure of 7.5 dB. More than that, we need an LNA with a 4 dB noise figure, a mixer with 9 dB, and a VGA of 12 dB. Um, the the chain of the, the, the gain, as it were, in, in the cascade, we're looking at minus 2.5 dB from the insertion loss, which I just eyeballed from the, uh, the S21 figure. 
20 dB gain for the LNA. We're assuming a passive mixer, and that, that foreshadows, again, this, the interference that's, that's, that's uh, hanging out there that we're going to design for. So we've got, I assume, minus 5 dB gain for the mixer, and then um, line share of the gain in the, the low-frequency amplifier. And now what, we have now what we have now that we didn't have before was the, uh, the in-band phase noise spec and the flicker noise corner frequency. So, like I mentioned earlier, now what we're going to do is, is we've, we've pretty much gotten as much out of this, this model as we possibly can. Uh, so we need to start thinking about migrating to a technology that gives us simulation capabilities to add even more detail. And in this case, the, uh, the um, first thing that we need to do is, is, is do some things to, to, to maintain our speed advantage. And one thing we can do is instead of measuring the bit error rate, we can see what that equivalent chip error rate is using the same design that we had before. So this hasn't, now this hasn't changed. But what has changed is if you look inside the receiver, we're looking at the chip error rate as opposed to the, uh, the bit error rate. And so now we've got something that's on the order of 3.5% versus the six one hundredths, or one thousandths of a percent. And that means that we can simulate for a shorter amount of time, fewer bits through the system, which is more amenable when we start to include the circuit envelope simulation. So uh, again, the nothing was changed in the design per se. We're just looking at a, a different metric now. We're looking at chip error rate. Okay. So now what we're going to do is add a more detailed design uh, for the, the RF receiver. And just a minute to open up here. What you see is, is now a design that starts to look a lot like what you would expect to see for the receiver. The uh, that single cascade has now been split into I and Q branches. We've got, again, an S parameter block that we can, we can visualize. We've got an LNA with, with, uh, with more specifications. Notice the IP2. Whereas before we only had access to IP3, IP2 for a direct conversion design is, is uh, uh, at least as important as IP3, probably more so, especially in the mixer. So the mixer is now performing frequency translation. It performs a, a mixing operation, as you would expect. We've got an external port to feed a local oscillator signal in. Again, you are performing mixing, so you need two signals to operate on. We've got a phase shifter that separates or that, that translates what's coming in, uh, called a cosine, into a sine. And what, what that gives you the flexibility to do also is start to tune the impairments. What if, you're, what if you're half a degree off? How does that affect your system? Because this block is in here now, you can do that. But in general, what we expect it to be is, is uh, um, is, is very much a, uh, we, hold on one second. What, what we expect this to be is very similar to the last design because this is just a calibration bench. And so let's, let's check this out. So again, this, this does take a little more time. If you notice, I've got the accelerator turned on as well. And, and what that does is, is that, that uh, Simulink looks at the model. It generates uh, C code to speed up the model. And uh, so it takes a little, little while longer on the startup, but then it, it, uh, it simulates faster. So that's, that's what we're waiting on right now. And again, the, the point of this model is just to 
we, we made a we, we made a break. We we pulled the uh, the despreading filter out of the receiver. We're, we're synchronized to to chips and not bits. We just want to verify that we haven't changed the problem. So as soon as this starts to run, we'll get a quick visual, check the box, and we'll we'll move on. So the initialization is, is costing us a little more time than we have. So let's, uh, let's let this populate just a quick second. There we go. And you see the signal power level is the same as it was before. And the uh, chip error rate, if we let this run, will will in fact be within that 3.5% that range. So again, we haven't changed the problem. So we're going to stop that, and we're going to keep going, because the intent, and we may not make it to the data converter part of the design, but again, I'll share the models with you so that you can, uh, you can uh, experiment with those uh, at your leisure. So the last model that I'm going to show at the system level, before we get into the data converter, is the, the model that includes a it, it is a circuit envelope model of the receiver, like the last one. But I just want to show you a few things that are in this that make it a suitable model to simulate the effect of, of uh, um, some of the, most, the, the difficult impairments in direct conversion design. So first thing, we've got broadband isolation problems between the LO and the RF, which will manifest itself in a spike at DC. Um, we do have the IP2 was, was, uh, was uh, preserved from the last model, this model. So what we expect to see is a, um, since we have imperfect isolation, we expect to see a, 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 a spike at DC. And we have interference, so we do expect to see um, some interference skirts, as it were, uh, at, at the, uh, in the receive band. So again, this is going to take just a couple minutes. And uh, so, so what this means? Let's let's let this run, and uh, and we'll end the, uh, the the presentation after this model, and uh, then then you can contact me. I'll send you the rest of the the, uh, the files, and, and you can look at the uh, um, design of the data converter. Again, it's top down. We've got a, a if you recall a high level spec for the data converter. The uh, the next the next step is to start to add the, uh, the design architecture of, in this case, a second order Sigma Delta, as well as the anti-aliasing filters. And uh, it's given our time constraints, probably best that we uh, leave that as for a uh, exercise. So this is, again, it's initializing. So one of the things you might notice is uh, is now our system level model has a uh, a new block. Right? It's a uh, we've got a DC offset cancellation block. We didn't need that block before because there was no there were no issues because we didn't we weren't modeling the isolation problem between the LO and the RF port. So it looks like we are starting to run. Let's take a look at the uh, the figures here. Right. So here's our DC offset. Here's the uh, wideband interference. In this case, the CDMA signal. We constructed this signal the same way we constructed the uh, the Zigbee signal. Here's the peak at, at uh, DC. So we measure the spectrum before DC offset correction. So we expect to see that. What you don't see is the effect. It's not obvious anyway, unless you look closely, the effect of 
the high power interference and IP2. And we can improve that by increasing the power of our input signal. Again, this is going to disrupt the measurement of the, the, the chip error rate, but neither here nor there. So you start to see the signal come up out of the noise floor. And let's see the effect of uh, IP2 with the interference. Increase the power of the interfering signal. And so here we see right here the, uh, the effect of IP2 and the WCDMA signal. And uh, this over here is the constellation diagram adjusting. It, it takes time for that to adjust. So I think with that, let's, uh, let's, let's start to wrap it up. I'll bring up the uh, very quickly the rest of the, uh, this HTML file. What I use for the, uh, the Sigma Delta data converter design is a uh, is a uh, set of subroutines from the DELSIC toolbox you can download from MATLAB Central, written by uh, Schreier and Thames. Uh, very much follows their book, uh, Understanding Sigma Delta Modulators. I believe it gets close to 400 downloads a month. So we're going to start with somebody who's already solved the problem at the high level. Um, choose the loop filter, a, a cascaded integrated, cascade integrated feedback loop filter. This is what we predict for the SNR, and um, we actually are able to, using Simulink, real quick, we can simulate that particular design. Here's our noise shaping. Here's our peak. We change our, again, MATLAB's not too far away. Change PN. 58 dBm because that's the gain after the uh, after the uh, RF receiver. Run it again. So we still have 20 dB of uh, of uh, of uh, SNR. From the data converter, we said before we needed 16, so we're, we're good. This model can then be plugged into the uh, previous system level model. So let's let's wrap up. So there's time for some questions. So what I what I attempted to show you today was how to use MathWorks tools for top-down design of wireless systems. Uh, I focused on Simulink, DSP System Toolbox, Communication System Toolbox, SimRF. Uh, the data converter simulation uh, is actually using a tool called SimPower Systems that, again, is, is, is true to this, the, uh, the uh, concept that we, we're, we're, we want to simulate quickly uh, and, and make some level of, of uh, trade-off on the fidelity of the models. And we use SimPower Systems for that for analog baseband design. And then uh, certainly reach out to me. This is my uh, email address. I can, uh, I can uh, share the models with you at the very least, and uh, we can talk about some of the parts of this webinar that we weren't able to cover today. So with that, I can open up to questions, and, uh, and I'll hand it back to Lee. Thanks, Chris. Um, so again, if you can use your question screen or else raise your hand, um, we can take some questions now. Okay. Um, while people are typing in their questions, I'll just put up a couple of uh, final notices for everyone. So while you're typing your questions, uh, just a couple of final notes. 
Uh, first, there will be a, a satisfaction survey on this webinar that's sent to everyone. Uh, we use these surveys to help us to determine what kind of webinars we should be offering in the future and how to improve the quality of the webinars we have. Um, if, you know, we hope that everybody can fill this out, so if, um, once you receive that, if you, can, if you can take just a couple of minutes and, and fill that out, we'd really appreciate it. Um, we're looking for proposals for our April and May webinars. Uh, so uh, the next webinar we do will be towards the end of April, and we're still seeking proposals for that webinar. So our, uh, putting in a proposal to do a webinar is really simple. There's a link online. All we need is an abstract. Um, so if you can go to the uh, webinars, tutorials, and resources page on our website, you'll be able to find the, uh, the call for, for proposals there, and uh, look forward to hearing from everybody. Um, so with that, um, are there any questions? I haven't seen any typed in yet. Chris, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Um, did you have, uh, we still have another moment or two, if you had anything you wanted to, any final thoughts you wanted to share? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think in general uh, the, uh, the the notion of system level design is for for radios and uh, transmitters as well. It, it seems like it is gaining momentum, and uh, I, I think that uh, as, as people start to build more complex systems, I, I think there's a real place for this. And uh, I, I think MATLAB and Simulink are are very good useful tools for this. There are certainly other tools as well. Um, but again, I, I think uh, if if people want more information, uh, they can certainly reach out, and uh, that's that's uh, that's really my the only final thoughts I have, Lee. Okay. So with that, it uh, it doesn't look like there are any questions. So um, I want to, Chris, thank you very much for for uh, pulling together this webinar and presenting it. I know uh, I know doing these things is a lot of work, so we really appreciate it. Um, and again, I uh, th thank everybody who attended, and um, I uh, look forward to to seeing everybody at a at a future forum event. Oh, wait, wait, question just came in. Oh, it's just a thank you. Okay, <laughs> um, we we received a, a thank you through the question window. So uh, with that, we'll we'll close the webinar now. And again, if anybody has any uh, questions at all. Um, please feel free to contact me. Uh, my email is shown on the screen. And um, thanks again.